Adina Howard rose to fame in the 90s with a sound, a look, and an attitude that upended the rules for women in music. Once she made up her mind about something, that's exactly what she was gonna do. And she didn't care about the consequences. For her musical career though, that approach would lead to disaster. Adina Howard was born Adina Marie Walker on November 14, 1973 in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Her father worked as a furniture assembler while her mother took care of her and her three younger sisters at home. She grew up attending church of various denominations regularly and also sang there. While Sundays were strictly for the Lord, Adina was allowed to listen to secular music the other days of the week. Some of the artists that could be heard in the home were Minnie Riverton, Gladys Knight and the Pips, and Patti LaBelle. Every chance she got though, she'd get her hairbrush and belt out her favorite Whitney Houston tunes. In a 2015 interview with Rolling Out, she spoke about how she came to discover her talent for singing. My mother made me sing more often than not when I was a child. I really don't know why, because my singing was not the business back in the day. She obviously heard what I couldn't. It wasn't until later in life that I began to hear what she knew was there. Sadly, Adina's musical dreams were gradually shadowed by her home life as her parents' marriage came apart. Her father, who was an alcoholic and drug addict, would stay out all night and not come back for a day or two sometimes. The next thing everyone knew, he was gone. He traveled clear across the country to California with another woman. When he came back, he and Adina's mother got into an argument and she ended up leaving the house and the marriage that day. According to Adina, she felt her father's presence the most when she became a teenager. By that time, her mother had already taken her and her sisters to live in Phoenix, Arizona. It was a major culture shock for her, especially when it came to getting attention from boys. Back in Michigan, everyone was checking for her. In Phoenix, not so much. That is, until she became of age physically and her insatiable desire for sex took hold. According to R&B Haven, when Adina was living in Mesa, Arizona, she met producers Ray Hunter and Ron Keel. Ray wanted her to become a member of a girl group named Deja Vu, but Ron saw more potential in Adina and wanted her to go solo. However, before the guys could set up a deal with her, she'd gotten help from someone else, signed a deal, and left the two men behind. That new and seemingly better opportunity came when she met producer and singer Livio Harris, who was performing with his vocal group called For Sure. When he was standing around signing autographs after a show, Adina came up to him and boldly stated she didn't want his autograph, he should want hers. Her sass made him take notice and want to work with her. Livio then teamed up with producer Roger Romain to craft songs and an image to fit Adina's personality. The moment she got into the studio, she was off and running, unafraid to express herself vocally or sexually. Adina was quickly signed to independent label Mecca Dawn with distribution through Atlantic's East West Records and dropped her debut album titled Do You Wanna Ride in 1995. The album couldn't be more true to its cover with song titles like You Got Me Humpin', If We Make Love Tonight, and Horny For Your Love. But it would be the equally spicy title track and debut single, Freak Like Me, that would put her on the map. It went platinum, climbing all the way to number two on both the R&B and Hot 100 charts. Naturally, the Freak Like Me image came with some positives and negatives. She was able to be herself and as sexually liberated as she wanted to be, but there was also a perception by men that if they were just as freaky, that made them the chosen one. Adina's made it clear that she's the one that does the choosing, not the other way around. Two other singles off the album were released, My Up and Down and It's All About You. They did moderately well, helping Do You Want to Ride? Go Gold. Fun fact, the video for My Up and Down was deemed too explicit for BET's video programs, but it played on The Box, a pay-per-view video channel at $2.50 a pop. As reported in a 1995 article by the Washington Post, some felt that Adina embodied everything wrong with pop culture. See Dolores Tucker, head of the National Political Congress of Black Women and a leading critic of explicit lyrics said, I have seen the cover of Adina Howard's album. I find it pornographic and reprehensible. She added that Adina signifies lost young people who stoop to such a low self-image in order to sell records. 
To others, Adina is a heroine for female liberation, somewhat at ease with her sexuality and smart enough to cash in on it. In our society, women, again, are perceived as being, you know, the timid ones, the passive ones, the... Um, we're only sensual and sexy when men want us to be sensual and sexy. And I just refuse to fall into that category and be controlled like that. Because if guys can do it, I can do it too. And regardless of what the females thought and what the guys even thought, because, you know, guys, there were some guys that said, okay, she's a hoe, you know, she's easy, she's promiscuous. And, and it was like, no. Nah. It would, if that's your perception of me, then that's my perception of you. And, you know, I'm going to call a spade a spade. Adina also dealt with pushback from her peers in the music industry, as she detailed in her 1995 feature in People magazine. She told the story of a disappointing encounter with legendary jazz vocalist Nancy Wilson in an airport in Cleveland. I remember being excited. I remember just being elated to see her because I was a fan. I love her, even to this day, I love her voice. I just thought she was so just amazing. And to meet her and introduce myself and to get the response that I got, it was like, wow, didn't expect that. Okay, it was, it was, it was awkward. But at the end of the day, it still did not like, it didn't stop me from saying, like, yo, that's Nancy Wilson. She don't like my music. That's Nancy Wilson. <laughs> you know, she was a seasoned woman at the time. She's still a seasoned woman. But at the time, I was 21, and she was up there in age. And so she comes from a different era. So I could totally see her perspective on not being comfortable with the title of the song or the content of the song. So, I mean, it is what it is. Everybody have their own, their, their own um, perception. And everybody's, you know, where they are on their journey. And they like what they like and they don't what they don't. Ironically, as Adina's star rose, she found herself playing less and working harder. She wasn't able to freak, so to speak, like she wanted to and done in the past. She had to strike while the iron was hot and stay on her grind. In the studio, that is not the bedroom. Fun fact, it was that crazy work schedule that unfortunately prevented her from taking a cameo role in the 1995 romantic comedy film, Waiting to Exhale. There was one special person in her life that was able to steal a little bit of her time. On her 2019 episode of TV One's Unsung, Adina revealed that while she was working on her second album, she found herself in a relationship with Wanye Morris of Boys to Men, who at the time was dating her label mate, Brandy. When whispers about Adina and Wanye's fling reached the ears of high-powered music exec Sylvia Roan, also known as Adina's boss, the love triangle got even more complex and complicated. Unbeknownst to Adina at the time, she was about to make some regrettable choices that would put her fate and entire career on the line, ending in disastrous results for her. If you didn't know, Sylvia is widely regarded as one of, if not the most influential woman in the music business ever. So when Adina made the mistake of crossing her, she learned the hard way that making an enemy at the executive level can have consequences that no amount of talent, drive, or buzz could ever fix. Sylvia spoke with Adina and implored her to let the relationship go and focus on her career. Adina didn't want to, and word of the situation became the talk of the town. Wendy Williams, then a radio DJ and gossip queen on New York station Hot 97, heard about it and called Adina, which is when she changed the course of her life. I said something very inappropriate about the head of the label and she pulled up the emergency brake, shut everything down. And rightfully so, because you know, when you got the power to do that and you don't like what somebody's saying about you. With her follow-up project now on hold, Adina caught a break thanks to an invite from Warren G to duet on a remake of the Tina Turner hit, What's Love Got To Do With It? The track made it on the top 40 pop chart and was included on the Police Story 3 Super Cop soundtrack. In the midst of all the drama going on with her next album, Adina found a supporter in a friend of one of her sisters named Sherman Jordan. They first became friends, then much more than friends, and many years later, eventually married. 
Despite tensions with her label, Adina continued to work on a second album titled Welcome to Fantasy Island. While preparing for a release in the summer of 1997, her label dropped its lead single called Freak and You Know It. It didn't fare well on the charts. Some people behind the scenes believe that to be due to the title and subject matter being too similar to that of her first big hit. Then her label put the final nail in the coffin. Adina's album was getting shelved indefinitely, and she was getting kicked to the curb. Though the album was never officially released, one of the tracks, a song called T-Shirt and Panties, took on a life of its own. Written by and featuring Jamie Foxx, it was originally slated for the soundtrack to his 1997 buddy comedy, Booty Call, but it eventually ended up on the soundtrack to the 1998 romantic comedy, Woo. Throughout the 2000s and 2010s, Adina stretched her acting skills by appearing in a handful of productions. Her music career carried on with live gigs. Then in 2004, she released an album called The Second Coming. It features a song coupled with an eye-catching music video called Nasty Grind. Unfortunately, the video did nothing to help the song, and it, as well as the entire album, flopped. To add insult to injury, the label, Rough Town Records, named her in a $10 million lawsuit. Reportedly, they were unhappy with the poor sales performance of the album. Adina lays the blame squarely on the lack of promotion by Rough Town, headed by singer Renee Moore of Renee and Angela fame. Her fourth album, Private Show, was delayed many times by Arsenal Records. However, it was ultimately released in the summer of 2007. A couple of singles dropped, but neither they nor the album itself charted. By now, Adina felt, and knew, her life was headed in a different direction. She decided to not be like other artists, constantly trying to relive their heydays and tap into her other talents. Those talents led her to the kitchen. In 2012, she graduated from Le Cordon Bleu with an associate's degree in culinary arts. Over the next several years, Adina continued to make her mark as a chef in the Phoenix area. It seemed for all intents and purposes that her singing career was behind her, but then her past caught up with her in a good way. Fans were beginning to have a hunger again for real R&B music. So like many of her fellow counterparts that exploded in the 90s, Adina started getting calls to get back on stage. She also got back into the studio and released her fourth album titled Resurrection in 2017. Around this same time, she and Sherman would divorce, but continue to maintain a great friendship. In a 2020 interview with R&B Junkie Official, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of her debut album, Adina was asked if she thought or knew it would make the impact it did and pave the way for those who followed. She said, Absolutely not. No, not in a million years. I just went in to do my job. I was blessed with the favor of having success, but no. My mind was let's get this job done. You know what I'm saying? When you're going through the process, long hours, late nights, bad food, in my mind and in my head, I hope this pays off. In February 2021, her previously shelved album, Welcome to Fantasy Island, was finally released in the United States. In 2023, Adina set her sights on the world of fine wine, introducing her brand, Indelible. The alcoholic beverage captivates wine enthusiasts with its exquisite flavor and leaves a lasting impression, much like her music. Oh, 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 oh,